Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're glad you joined us and I'm excited to introduce you to Trace Thurlby. Trace is the CEO of Global Orphan Project and I can't remember Trace, when we first met, it might have been that trip to Haiti. Yeah, I think it was maybe 2011. Was that 2011? Mm -hmm. And we spent a week in Haiti together? Yeah, the one year anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti. Yeah. We were there together. Cycled around Haiti, gave bikes out to orphan kids. Yeah. And yeah. It was a special week. It was a good week. It was. It definitely was. So, uh, so welcome to Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, let's start with, I just like to have people introduce like where you were born, where you grew up, give us some background story of, of Trace. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in Russellville, Arkansas, which is kind of a, a little big town, I'd like to say. 20,000 people right between Little Rock and Fort Smith. Biggest town in a 45 mile radius, uh, Dry County, Bible Belt. And, um, you know, I didn't was, even know they still had dry counties. Isn't that interesting? People are always fascinated by that. I was down there mountain biking um, one yeah. one week, and I was we were with uh, some some buddies, and they were like, "Let's go get you know some drinks," and we were in a dry county, yeah. and I'm like, "What? I didn't even know those existed." Yeah, you got to get across the county line. Yeah, there's yeah. a little. There's a liquor store there, right across the line. There, there's a town called Blackwell, literally uh -huh. Blackwell, right? And yeah. there are a couple of liquor stores, you know, about ten feet across the county line, and that's still very much my childhood home. Uh, at 18, I'd promised my parents I would pay for college, cut a deal with them, and um, ended up uh, joining the military was in the Air Force for eight years and um, and then went to the business world in California for six. Uh, and then my uh, wife and I have been here in the Kansas City area since 2004, where we've raised our family. So we've lived in all four time zones. Um, we've been in the military, I've been in business, I've been in ministry, um, married 28 years, uh, four wow. kids, 21 to 16, and um, you know, really grateful to, to call Kansas City home now. That's awesome. What, um, what, when you were growing up in Russellville? Russellville, yeah. Russellville, Arkansas. The Russellville Cyclones. Okay. Yeah. Small high school? One high school. Yeah. Was it how many in your graduate yeah, class? Yeah, no, it was a, like I said, it was a little big town. There okay. were 313. Okay. Yeah. So we were the biggest town in a, in a 45 mile radius. So all, all the other small towns would come and hang out in Russellville yeah. on Friday night. Yeah. And were you an athlete in high school? Yeah, that was kind of what there was to do. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I did. I played I played a few sports. Uh, basketball was the big sport, but you know I love basketball. But I looked at my mom; she's five feet one, and I figured that probably is going to get capped. It's it's <laughs> at some uh, level mm. right after high school. Um, picked up soccer, which was um, kind of a new sport back then. And then, and then the, my love is tennis. And so mm -hmm. I, I played uh, high school tennis into college and still enjoy doing that on a regular basis. Awesome. Who, who do you, who do you find to play with at your level? Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing yeah. you're fairly, you're pretty good if you play through college. So then how do you find somebody to play with around here? Well, not that many good college tennis players around. Well, you know, I'm 50 now. And so <laughs> it's getting easier and easier, I guess, is, is the reality. I've got a couple, pretty, I've got a couple of good buddies. you're going to go to pickleball. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to alienate half your listeners if I tell you what I think about pickleball. And it might be the end of your podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I, one of my friends, you know, like started chicken and pickle around. Now, I mean, you know, 
We were there. Yes, we were there yesterday. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. So that's yeah. a great place. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of buddies, and one of them is specifically is ten years younger, way mm-hmm. way fitter, you know. And um, he's pretty. He doesn't have kids, so he's real flexible with my schedule. Yeah. He and I have probably played once a week for fifteen years. Oh wow! Yeah, so that's been fun. And you trade off winning. I win less than half of the time. Wow. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we somewhere between zero percent and forty nine percent. So this is some real competition. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. And then, how about your spiritual journey? What, like, growing up yeah. in Russellville, were you? Yeah. Were you brought up in a church? Yeah. Or, okay. I was. Uh, you know, I I grew up uh, in the First United Methodist Church, and across the street were the was First Baptist Church. In town, because it was a dry county, you know, there aren't many places that have good restaurants depend on their liquor license, right? So we had one place in town that had uh, kind of the, the monopoly on the after church lunch crowd. It's called Madame Wu's. That was the Chinese restaurant. And uh, we, we would beat the Baptists there because our sermons were shorter than theirs, right? right? right. So by the time the Baptists were rolling in, we were halfway through our, uh, <laughs> you know, our, our uh, Asian, you know, orange chicken dish. And we would look at them and think, you know, well, we're really glad we're not Baptists because we'd have to wait for, and they're looking at us feeling, you know, like we're glad we're not Methodists with their short sermons. And, and so it was, um, yeah, I was raised um, being taught some truths you know that that Jesus loves me, and uh, and died for my sins, and I I appreciated that. But honestly, no one ever really explained to me why that was important or why I would need that. Mm-hmm. And so um, it wasn't until I got kind of into my twenties and I started to see you know that life can be tough and and um, and that the things that I was struggling with, they weren't going to just go away. I wasn't going to outgrow um, my sin and my, and my selfishness. And so um, that was the whole process of, of starting to own my own faith. And I can remember at 26, my wife and I moved to California and we, did you meet her when you, you were in the military when you met her Yeah, crazy. in Colorado Springs? You know, we met, in high school at a high school tennis match and we left for college as kind of romantic pen pals she grew up in hot springs arkansas and uh, she went to school in boston and we tried to date long distance and we tried to break up and we tried to ruin our relationship every way that we could but uh, god wouldn't let us let us miss it and we got married uh, a few weeks after graduation at 22 and 21 and mm. like to say we've kind of grown up together mm. so i was out of the military at this time and i was going to work for franklin templeton an investment company we landed on the monterey peninsula there are only a few churches there and we landed at, at a, a calvary chapel church and there's these 50 minute sermons right in the methodist church here's i was getting these 20 to 25 minute sermons that were kind of topical and you know positive but this is is monterey california it was monterey california who who was the pastor bill holdridge okay yeah all right his son nate is the pastor there now and okay and so i remember landing we didn't know anybody in town i just went Mm -hmm. for the job i didn't know anybody in the state except the guy that hired me and so we were in the book of daniel on sundays we were showing up to church because we didn't have anything else to do. On Wednesdays, we were in Revelation, and a home group on Friday, we were in First John. And the sermons were like verse by verse, nine, ten verses, 50 minutes. And I can remember I'd never read the Bible before. I'd never read all of it. Certainly mm-hmm. read, hadn't read most of the Old Testament. And I can remember thinking, if I'm going to listen to like 10 verses for an hour, <laughs> on some Old Testament prophet. Like, I need to decide whether I believe that this book is true or not. Mm. Like, I'd always believed it was good, mm-hmm. but like, whether it's true, whether it's authoritative. And so that led me on this, this reading of some apologists, Ravi, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, and I can remember reading McDowell, More Than a Carpenter, a little C.S. Lewis. There's this chapter in More Than a Carpenter where it's talking about the evidence of the resurrection. And it talks about how you know Judas had hung himself, John is at the cross, the other 10 guys are gone, right? And church history says that those 10 guys that were too afraid to stand with Jesus at the cross later gave their life for their faith. Mm-hmm. 
And I thought, why would 10 cowards become 10 martyrs, right? 10 out of 10, like that's wild. And then I thought, Jesus is alive. Like they saw him alive. And I believed it for like for the first time in a new way. Mm. And I started to see God not as this kind of detached father that didn't understand me as a young man, but as a loving father who actually knew me and had written this, this love letter to me to say, hey, when I say don't, I'm mean saying don't hurt yourself. And I, I, I started trying to see like, not how far can I stand away from him and call myself a Christian, but what's life look like if I see how close I can get to him? And that was about almost 25 years ago. Mm. And it was a real marker. Life has been, has been an adventure since then. I still screw up all the time. Um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to screw up. And, and, and when I do, I'm, I'm grateful for, for the grace that's, that's offered in that relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a Calvary chapel, Calvary chapel. Uh, that's a, you know, cause I was a vineyard pastor for 29 yeah. years and, um, really Calvary and vineyard, um, grew up together. Yeah, they share a lot of the same DNA. Yeah. Yeah, the guy that started the first vineyard church is a guy named Ken Gullickson, and uh, he was on staff at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, which mm -hmm. was Chuck Smith's yeah, church. Yeah, it's a big one. And he moved to L.A., started the first vineyard, and that was back when... 70s, maybe? Yeah, it was late late 70s, mm -hmm. like probably like 77, mm -hmm. somewhere around in there, 76 maybe. And I don't think Calvary Chapel wasn't planting churches at that time. So when Ken left Calvary, he just, you know, he, he actually got the name from a passage in Isaiah about the Lord's vineyard. Yeah. And uh, so uh, early, early, early days of the vineyard and vineyard and Calvary were really intertwined. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we were so, there for six years and it was really, mm. it was really a great season of life. Yeah. Very cool. Well, fun. Uh, so... So you were in. So when you left high school, you went immediately to Colorado Springs at the uh, at the academy. Did your four years there? While you were at the academy, you got married. Yeah, that's probably one of the really good rules of the academy. They don't let you get married while you're there. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't ready. I probably would have tried to if they would have let me. Okay. But yeah, we got married about six weeks after. So the so, day after you graduate, okay, you can get married. Okay. And some people do, you know. And were you um, what? What were you doing in the military? I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, so it's funny, you know. While you're there, obviously the Air Force fly, fight, and win, right? The the pilot is at the pointy end and everyone else yeah. is supporting the pilot. Yeah. And so they encourage you to at least consider flying. I mean, that's a lot of the people that are there, that's their lifelong dream. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't wasn't my lifelong dream, but I still kind of got exposed to, to flying. And they'd put me on a fast plane and I would puke. And they'd put me on a slow plane and I would take a nap, you know? And I thought, these are not the genetic giftings of a, of a pilot. So um, I, I was a, a management major there and they sent me to go get my MBA okay. uh, right off the bat. And then I went to into what they call acquisitions, which is kind of project management. So I served as the kind of the middleman between pilots that were flying the B-2 and F-117, the stealth aircraft, between the Pentagon that was paying for the upgrades and the defense contractors that were developing the system. And I can make it sound really, really good, and I was mm -hmm. very proud to serve. I, mm -hmm. I have a daughter in the Navy now. My brother is um, also went to the Air Force Academy, was in Afghanistan. I am very grateful for the military, but my own career was not very long nor distinguished. Um, so very thankful for that, but I could tell that, um, you know, while I liked what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, that whole system is also the system that made the thousand dollar toilet seat. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to move my family, you know, five, six, seven times over a 20 year military career. Mm -hmm. So when they said, you know, Hey, you're done. I was like, well, thanks for letting me serve. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, went into the business world. So when, so you got married and then what was your first workout, right? When you were married? Yeah. They sent me to Pittsburgh 
to the, to the Cats Graduate okay. School of Business to get an MBA because okay. it was a condensed 46 week program. Okay. And then we went to Boston, Hanscom Air Force Base, where I served as an acquisitions officer until I got out as a captain. Gotcha. And that's when you moved to Monterey. That's it. And, yeah. And your job at Monterey was. Yes. Yeah, so I worked with uh, Franklin Templeton Investments. It was a publicly traded company. And um, at the time, there was this. So you have kind of institutional accounts at the top, you know, pension funds. And then at the bottom, you have more retail like mutual funds. And in the middle, there's this middle market of separate accounts. And Templeton was r rolling out this middle market separate account portfolio. And I was kind of, a, I was on the portfolio management team. And then from there, my, I went to really work for a man more than a company. There was a West Point grad that, that I had met through my time in the military and uh, he was a dynamic leader and, and I wanted to go serve for him and he appreciated my time in the military and so he offered me the job and then he left a couple of years in and started his own company and so at, at uh, 28 years old you know I was in Monterey starting this company called Centurion Alliance and we didn't have a website or an office or a phone or a client or anything like that and so i'd always wanted to do that i think i had kind of romanticized it it's actually mm. a lot of a lot of work but for the next four years um got the chance to to um, build that with some some people that i still really respect and care about today okay so from from california did you do you have your, your kids there yeah we had two. our we had our our two oldest daughters there mm -hmm. and then we moved to kansas city in 04. Mm -hmm. it was it was interesting there um my wife had some pretty serious autoimmune issues early in our marriage and so we thought adoption was going to be how we built our family mm -hmm. and about six years into that I mean, we had an attorney hired we were you know moving down that road and she um had a had a she went into remission and the doctor said you know you can try to have kids and so we had two within 19 months and we were pregnant with our third and uh and we miscarried and then and then we moved and kind of in that move we we're like why would we, we be excited about adoption? Like we were, we were excited about it. Mm. It wasn't like we were accepting this plan B. We just thought this is gonna mm -hmm. be plan A, like yeah. a new plan A, it's not plan B. And um, we were like, why would we not do it? Just because we can have biological children. And so uh, that was this really quick conversation. And my wife's like, well, there's this place at, Johnson County Library that's talking about adoption tonight. They're doing a little seminar and uh, let's go. Mm. And by the time we left that, we'd filled out the paperwork for our first daughter, um, the first adopted daughter. Mm -hmm. So she came uh, at one year old. What organization did you work through? Holt International. Yeah, okay. Holt. Yeah, yeah. is it? it yeah, it was, it was so pragmatic, mm. you know. Where, our, did, where was she? She was from, from China, yeah, from okay. Shenrao. And you know, our, our thinking was well, we got girls, we have girl clothes, we have girl toys, yeah. you know, let's let's not mess up the birth order, let's get a healthy child, mm. let's let's you know, let's make this clean. And it was so pragmatic. And uh as crazy as it was, we, th we kinda of thought we were done. She came over and she's beautiful, she's sixteen now. Um and I I just said, you know, Lord, if you want us to have more kids, you can bring them. Because by this time, I was now into full-blown orphan ministry, which we may get to, yeah. maybe not. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. <laughs> but uh, I, I tried actually to adopt a couple of kids mm -hmm. uh, that I had come across in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that one of them actually had family, mm -hmm. which I was like, that's, that's, I'm swimming in the deep deep into the pool, I didn't mm -hmm. even realize it. Another one, um, by the time we would have been able to get him, he would have been too old. And so we were starting to realize, you know, when you go after one child, it's not a guarantee that you're gonna get them, right? Lots of doors can close. And so we were fine with that. We were a family of, of, of three. And um, I'll just try to shorten this, this story, but we'd had all these Chinese friends 
because our daughter was kind of this bridge to the Chinese community. We were doing life with four or five families that spoke Mandarin in the home in, you know, over on Park. We all were also doing life with some adoptive families. And one of the families adopted this uh, 10, 11 year old boy and single mother. She had to go back to work while he was waiting to start school. He comes to our home. One of our Chinese friends comes over to translate and they're having a conversation in Mandarin. My wife is cooking lunch. We don't speak Mandarin. The, the, the lady, Suman, who's translating, she starts laughing. And my wife's like, well, what's, what's so funny? And she said, well, well, he asked me if I would adopt his best friend. Well, it turns out that these, these two boys, since the time they were three and five, had cut this deal growing up in an orphanage in Lin Yi, China, that if either one of them ever got adopted, that they would find a family mm. for their best friend. Interesting. And this, this boy, Josh, hmm. had been in country two days, and he was looking to live up to his end of the deal. And, uh, and long story short, that's our son. Wow. So these two, these two guys who are best friends together in Lin Yi, China, you know, um, grew up together, uh, kind of would joke to each other every year that they weren't getting adopted, hmm. you know, now run cross country together and really? ride bikes together. And it's, it's, uh, it's probably wow. one of the cooler adventures that, that I've ever been a part of. So, so he's been our son now how for old, six how, and a half years. How old is he? Yeah, so we, had, so we adopted this one year old, right? Uh -huh. that, that was, it's like, we'll take any healthy baby girl. And then the next time through 10 years later, we was like, we'd like that almost 14 year old mm. blind boy, like that one, don't give us any other one. So when he came into our house, he was 13 and 10 months. Wow. And now he's 20. That's amazing. Very cool. Yeah, it's been, it's been cool. Wow. All right. So you, when you moved to Kansas City, what, what, what yeah. were you working? Who were you working with? So I worked with a, a Christian communication company called Bot Radio Network. I yeah. was their chief operating officer. So really, you know, I have this kind of eclectic resume it, it, on the surface. Some yeah. of it's military, some of it's business, some of it's ministry. But the reality yeah. is I'm, I'm kind of an operations guy. Yeah. I like to work on teams. I like to help, you know, what I like to say, I like to help kingdom teams win. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the, the pieces of that from mm -hmm. recruiting and training and, and budgeting and people development, yep. uh, I, that's what I've been asked to do. And that's what they asked me to do gotcha. from 04 to 09. Mm -hmm. 04 to 09, okay, yeah. And then uh, 09? Yeah, yes, 09 starts kind of back in 06. All right. So in 06, I get an email from this uh, buddy that I was meeting with on a regular basis. And he's like, don't know if it's your thing, but I'm going to Haiti and I wanted to invite you. And I just, I mean, I almost audibly groaned. You know, <laughs> I was like, that's so not my thing. You know, I, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a doctor, I don't speak French. I've never, I'd never been on a missions trip, couldn't find Haiti on a map. So I did what a lot of uh, people in the church do when they want to say no, is I told them I'd pray about it, right? <laughs> we all know that's code for I'm getting ready to tell you no after I toss up a couple prayers. And uh, anyway, I tried to I tried to get out of it, but um, I'm very thankful that I couldn't. Mm. And I went to to Haiti in 2006, and I can remember walking into this cafeteria in southern Haiti, concrete floors, wooden benches, tin roof, seeing 60 beautiful kids dutifully waiting for us to play with them. I'm with like 12 guys that I didn't really know. The guy who invited me ended up not even going. This was oh. October of 2006. Six, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I was the only one who just started weeping. Mm. I just, I just can remember, I can remember that moment. I can remember thinking, where did these kids come from? How many more of them are there? And how can I say that I believe what I say I believe if I have never done anything to mm. care for them? Mm. And, and life really, that, it was crazy. That same year we were filling out paperwork, right, for, for our daughter. Mm -hmm. So that was October. In February, on the Great Wall of China on Sunday, on Monday, they literally hand 16 
beautiful children over to 16 families. Each one of us paid about the price of a used speedboat. And, and I'm just like, what is going on? These two things that I thought were completely mm. disparate, different experiences now formed this kind of train track and are painting this big view of family. And I was in, I just couldn't get enough. Mm. So I started volunteering with this ministry called C3 Missions International. They didn't have any employees. They didn't have a website. They didn't have anything except these opportunities to have these divine collisions with the with mm. with children that God and this, this deeply what, loved. This was Mike Fox's first rendition of uh, work with orphans, right? Mike and Beth Fox are yeah. are the founders of C Three Missions International, yeah. which is the same organization that I now serve with called the Global Orphan Project. Yeah. The name changed in 2008. Yes. And I was volunteering with C3 Missions slash the Global Orphan Project from 06 to the end of 2009, beginning of 2010. Mm -hmm. I started serving full time with them. I think I was the number four employee in January or the, or the fourth employee, you know, okay. you know, on, in, in, on the team. And, yeah. And yeah. so this is, this is year 13. You know, and, and people are like, do you love your job? And I loved it before when I did it for free. You know, yeah. now I just get to do it more. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Mike Fox and I actually met through cycling um, yeah. because there was a, I, I was, I can't remember exactly what year it would have been that I started trying to seriously cycle, but uh, there was, a, there was a cycle place that Mike had bought up there on yeah. uh, Prairie View Road. Yeah. Cycle City now. Cycle City the, now in Parkville. That's right. But originally, I can't even remember the first name of it. Um, and I, I went in there and met one of his employees and started riding seriously. And then I, that's when I actually met Joe Fox, yeah. and we were riding and doing crits and competing. He was riding yeah. for KU, and I was riding for a, a, a team called Cowtown. And then every now and then Mike would show up on some bike rides and, you know, um, so that's where I met Mike. And uh, I can't remember somewhere right along in that space between 06 and 2010, I remember catching wind of Mike working with orphans mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and I had gone to Haiti once with, um, gosh, what's the company? Uh, Convoy of Hope. Mm -hmm. I'd gone with Convoy one once, but then uh, anyway, in 2011 was it? Um, I ended up. I was really wanting to get involved in some work with with orphans, and uh, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. Well, Mike, Mike's doing that stuff, and I so I remember calling Mike and talking, you know, we had all of a sudden we had a whole different conversation rather than yeah. bikes and sports. It was orphan work. So I hooked up, met you in 2011. And so you'd already been working with C3 and then Global Orphan started in 08. Yeah. So I 08? started in uh, volunteering in 06 and on staff in 2010. 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was your first role? Yeah. So, um, so my my role was chief operating officer, you know, president and COO. And okay. and Joe Kinnitig was there. He's the CEO. And really, I was just trying to take stuff off his plate. Mm -hmm. um, there was so much going on. And yeah, I just Mike and Mike and Beth are gifted and uh, gracious leaders, servant leaders. Um, there, there's joy you know, in mm -hmm. their lives. And I, I think they attracted a bunch of us, mm -hmm. right? To come and take a look in this space and mm -hmm. see if we could find joy and purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're all still together, serving together. Um, the, what's the, Joe's role now? Yeah, so Joe is the, he is the CEO and I'm the president and COO. So he's kind of, okay. yeah, that's so how it I is. So when I start, when I introduced you, <laughs> sorry, Joe. Yeah. That's all right, Joe, will be, he'll be okay with that. He'll, he'll maybe think he, he can take a day off, you know? Yeah, no, Joe is a gifted visionary yeah. and he and he's out there making rain and, I, and I'm trying to kind of catch the rain yeah. and, and get it in the ground. Well, I, I remember I interviewed 
Joe back when I was pastor in Vineyard, and we did. I I've done I've done interviews with Mike. I've done interviews yeah. with Joe. I think yeah, and then we I think we've connected with you a couple of times. So well, um, so let's do this. Let's talk about because didn't Mike start C three in Asia or yes. when his first connections in Asia? Yeah, that's the beginning. Oh three oh four in Southeast Asia. And let's let's tell the story. You tell yeah. the story. Yeah. What? How did C three get yeah. going? Why did it switch to Global Orphan? Yeah. Maybe talk about some of your strategy. Yeah. And what you know, some of those kind of things help people get, like, introduce people to this world. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I think um, we need to start with Mike because God is the is put his his finger on Mike and. When Mike went to Southeast Asia in 0304, he was a 48 year old, successful, happily married, Christ following business executive who was independently wealthy. And people can think, oh, I get this. I've heard this story before. This is just a guy who's got this thing as a side hobby, like a do gooder. He's a do gooder, right? That couldn't be further from the truth, right? Mike grew up a vulnerable kid. He's been very public about this, so obviously I wouldn't share anything that he hasn't shared in other settings. But um, his parents separated early. Um, there was uh, there was all kinds of abuse in his childhood, and um, you know he really was flagging at age nine, ten you know, was, was almost about to probably be in a place that would be really difficult to recover from. But his dad, who hadn't really been in his life up to that time, married, I think, his, at least his third wife and maybe his fourth. And she said, Fritz, how many, how many kids do you have? And he's like, well, I've got, I've got eight. And she said, well, where are they? Let's go get them. Mm. Let's round them up. Let's raise them. And so uh, they went and got Mike out of a situation that was, uh, was dark and, and brought him into their home. And I think at the time there were only six of them that were still, um, you know, under 18. So Mike was raised from the time he was 10. And this was, this is up, a, in up in Lathrop, up Missouri. Lathrop, Missouri. Yeah, yeah. Lathrop, Missouri. I did, I did the farmhouse classic a couple That's of times it. and we would start in the yard there. Yeah, he, he my <laughs> mile race on the gravel. Mike was, was gravel roads. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that's what they have up there, yeah. right? And, and he, was, he was raised in a two bedroom, one bathroom house with five older sisters and his, his dad Fritz and his stepmom Jenny who adopted him legally at 16 when Mike had his third birth certificate. So when he's in Southeast Asia, seeing these Karini refugees on the, the, the Thai-Burmese border, he doesn't see charity cases. He doesn't see a hobby. He saw himself. He saw those kids and he knew what it was like to be vulnerable and he knew how things could turn if somebody would believe in you and invest in you. And that was the beginning of C3 Missions. And he came home and he's like, I'm gonna start this organization and we're gonna invite our family and friends and we're gonna take maybe you know, trips over there and have five or 10 homes and, and I'm gonna keep my life. I'm gonna keep my corner office and all these other, other things that he had. And that was, a, that, was a, that was a reasonable plan, but you know, God's not always reasonable. Right, and so it blew past five and ten and fifteen to twenty-five homes, you know, and and not just in Southeast Asia, but the ministry was moving into Haiti and moving into Africa, and um, <clears throat> Mike left his his corner office job and just went in full time on this when he had a lot of meat on the bone in that career, but he realized this is what I want to do with mm -hmm. my time. This is what I want to do with my with my gifts. Um, 
and he named the organization C3 Missions International, which is like the worst name ever, right? People always think it's like children, church, and community, but it actually stood for C3H8, which is the chemical compound for propane gas, right? And Mike's company that he, with a team, had helped take public was was a, a propane company. So he named it after the company that, that fueled the ministry. And, and well, around 08 or 09, people would say, well, that's a great story, but who's Mike Fox again? You know, and we were, well, maybe, maybe we should change the name mm -hmm. uh, to something that actually explains the, the heart, mm -hmm. right, instead of propane gas. Yeah, yeah. And so it became the Global Warfarin Project. And, um, and I, think, I think a couple of the, the the big, the big truths. The, first of all, one of my favorite quotes is from Nelson Mandela, and he says, the keenest revelation of a society's soul is found in how it cares for its children. Ooh. Right? Mm. And in and, and every community in the world, there are three great truths around kids. First is that children and families are living at risk and vulnerable, period. It doesn't matter if it's Kansas City or Kampala or Kathmandu. Right. The second truth is that there are actually people in those communities that care about children that are at risk and they want to help them. Right. And then the third truth is, but kids are still falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Right. No one can declare mm -hmm. victory. Right. In, in our own country. Right. Child welfare is reactive and it's fragmented. So it's expensive and it's ineffective and children are falling right through the cracks mm -hmm. of society and, and, and on the doorstep of the state. So um, we think this is like a, a defining issue for our lives. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that it's right mm -hmm. for children to pay the highest price for the sins of a broken world, right? They, mm -hmm. they should not, but without a champion, they will and they do, right? Mm -hmm. So the Global Orphan Project exists to help break the orphan cycle, right? Because things are either cycling up or cycling down, right? to help break the orphan cycle through the power of community, because we b believe in, in local solutions, commerce, because we know that a lot of economic orphans around the world are uh, victims of, of poverty, which is oppressive, and the love of Jesus, who we think is Lord, uh, leader, and, and lover of our soul, and it, it fills our greatest needs. So that's our mission. I would say that, um, our strategy again is very local we believe that the local church should be part of the solution that regardless of what you believe about church and i know people have mixed experiences with it it's still the greatest distribution network in the world right it it still has uh, a biblical mandate to to care mm -hmm. uh for the orphan and the widow to love their neighbor uh has the anointing of the of the holy spirit um we uh, we believe that the church can and should, for the good of the church, invest in the lives of at-risk children and families. And so we don't want to try to create a whole other organization. Mm -hmm. We want to come up underneath local leaders, right, that are already caring for the kids and help connect them with other people that can resource them because we think we're better together. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, some of the real strategic things, uh, local, church base, culturally relevant, collaborative, connective, and uh, one of the greatest growth areas right now is, is a connective platform called Care Portal, which is kind of like an Uber for child welfare. Yeah, so, um, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. I, I just had coffee with Mike a couple, couple I don't know, a few weeks ago, and, uh, he spent a lot of time sharing with me about how excited he was about this care portal yeah. and what's going on there. But before we go to care portal, um, I think, um, tell me if, if, if this is still accurate, but, uh, when like whether you were in Asia, Haiti or somewhere in Africa, I mean, I can't remember what year it was. I, cause I'd been working in, in Ethiopia, and Mike, Mike actually flew over there one year with me, and I introduced him to as many people as I could, and um, helped try to fund uh, some of the orphan work there. And still going in, today in Ethiopia. Yeah. And uh, um, but always tried to find a local church. Always tried to find 
uh, mamas in the local churches who could work with these orphan kids uh, tried to some of the orphanage uh, raised the kids uh, living standards so highly that parents would orphan their kids to get them into the schools and Mike had seen that as an issue uh, in orphan work so he was really tried to make sure that there was a real screening process going on from the local church setting where they really know who the real orphans were and then still still try to get them into you know education safety uh it was a holistic care but also education and even micro businesses but still running it through the local church is that correct yeah that's all correct we okay. have uh, partnerships with over 60 local churches in 10 countries um and and that was absolutely the model mm -hmm. and i think as we got into that and mm -hmm. it, it's still part of the model okay uh, but we realized that the best place for a child is with a healthy loving family and so can we reach upstream to find that at-risk family and come with some of those supports job training school sponsorships family counseling still run through local leadership mm -hmm. in the local church so that fewer of those children have a need for 24 7 care right and so um that's been a strategic shift of the last five years like we mm -hmm. still want to help form that safety net mm -hmm. but in a best case scenario we want to reach upstream and bring that at-risk family into the life of that church and into schools and into businesses that that support that family so that um so that kids don't need to be raised by a house mama but they can be raised by their own mama and that the the, the father you know can provide through the dignity of work with a, a living wage job which we help provide with uh with goex apparel a, our t-shirt making arm so the, at, at the end of it we will use whatever tool god has whether it be ministry marketplace even media right to help reach that at-risk family as early as possible mm -hmm. but at the same time provide some support along that spectrum of care because the reality is it's not just an economic issue mm -hmm. and there are children they're going to fall through the cracks and there need to be also safe places but mm -hmm. but if we can reduce that number we we really feel like that's the highest and best use mm -hmm. of, of our time okay so you so you st you're still working in 10 countries which can you name those i i can those off i can haiti in the dr uganda congo south sudan malawi ethiopia india jordan and lebanon okay and then and then the u.s which which right you know and we'll, but, but not 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 that you uh, we're talking international here right exactly so the international model is a little different than when we talk about the care portal model that you're working now in america which I, I want to sure yeah focus on that a little bit yeah. too but yeah so um so you still still kids are still being screened at the local church level yeah. right yeah. and um and brought into community and you're trying to trying to obviously help uh, maybe the focus there is that you're trying to also incorporate at-risk families as well yeah, absolutely not, not just the kids but yeah. the, the family so the detail there is our church partners have social workers on staff that we help support and they're doing that casework of figuring out where is this family what do they need you know and mm -hmm. and uh, every now and then i mean one will come across a, a kid that doesn't have any family right a, a true double orphan mm -hmm. and, and even the double orphan generally will have a caregiver somewhere it could be an aunt could be a grandma but at times you know that gets really thin mm. and and they do need that that care so and the other thing about those situations just like the the us they're dynamic right people lose jobs people get jobs people get sick people get well people come back into a family mm -hmm. people leave a family and and so one of the things that we've added is that social worker that really 
is walking alongside that child and family because what the kid needs this year may change mm -hmm. over time. Okay. All right, and then then share a little bit about Care Portal because yeah. that, that's fascinating what's happening in that that realm. Yeah, there are two quick stories. It was, it was 2011, and Mike Fox comes to me and he said, Tracy, we need to grow. And um, that year we were doubling. And, and I said, Mike, what does that mean? You know, we're, we're adding school sponsorships, we're, we're gro moving into Africa, just, I'm, I'm open to that, I just don't know what it means. And he said, I don't, I don't either. He said, I'm gonna go back to Southeast Asia and I'm gonna pray and fast and walk the land and I'm gonna ask God to answer the question. And he comes back from that trip and he said that before he was even wheels down in Thailand, that God had convicted him that he had driven past children in Kansas City on his way to the airport that needed family. And he said, we're gonna do, keep doing everything internationally that we've been doing, but we're gonna grow home. And we're gonna help the US church care for local children and families that are at risk. Mm -hmm. And none of us had ever thought about that before. Right. We knew people were doing it. We thought it was good. We just thought our call was international. Mm -hmm. And we knew that God was now giving us this other chapter. We had no idea what we were doing, right? We just started failing forward, failing forward. But one of my uh, uh, good, good friends and, and teammates, Adrian Lewis, he was fostering at the time. And he had been fostering for a, a while, hard ministry, you know, I mean, is it is, is an adoptive parent, right? There's some permanency there. Right? Mm -hmm. You're you're in like foster parent. Mm -hmm. You've you've got to you know answer that question on a regular basis, right? Yeah. And um, so he's praying, and he's like, Lord, why are these kids that supposedly nobody wants so hard to get? And he gets this vision. It's a vision, and he draws it out on this piece of paper, and it's this online portal where social workers enter needs for at-risk children and families into a technology web-based platform and then they're shared in real time with local churches who have said they want to receive an email they want to know about vulnerable kids and families and so that are fairly pro in in proximity to them exactly to, to some degree yeah, right? absolutely you know it's yeah. all it's hyper local mm -hmm. and, and and just like how airbnb changed the way people vacation mm -hmm. you know or uber changed the way we call for a cab you know we're okay with these platforms right mm -hmm. we understand how they work and so um we looked at it we didn't have a developer on staff a software developer we had no budget we had no strategy but again we said that's the best idea any of us have ever had. And so, yes, you know, go do that. Mm -hmm. And um, Care Portal turned seven in uh, March, just a few months ago. Okay. So uh, today there are 28 states where Care Portal is active, three Canadian provinces. There are 500 different agencies from Child Protective Services to Pregnancy Resource Centers to schools to police departments to hospitals that are entering needs at the local level. They're shared with 3,600 churches, and those churches are serving 117 kids a day. Mm. Nobody hears about it, right? Mm. You turn on the news, you don't hear stories like this, mm -hmm. but they've served 140,000 children. Wow. And we feel like we're just getting started. Mm. Less than 2% of the churches are engaged. Mm. And there's tons of data behind all this, right? It's mm -hmm. a back-end database. Mm -hmm. When 10% of the churches in America will invest in local children and families in crisis, mm -hmm. the foster care crisis in this country will reverse. Mm. We, w we want in on that. Mm. That's so cool. I. <laughs> Yeah, and you've got at, at you've got states that are buying in to this. We right do, now, right? Yeah, I mean, child welfare is is a difficult space, I and mean, that, that's an understatement. Mm -hmm. But what we're able to because the so let me just give you a, a quick case study. Mm -hmm. Let's say there's a grandma, and her daughter needs to go to rehab for thirty to sixty days, mm -hmm. and um, she needs to bring her two granddaughters into her home mm -hmm. or they'll go into foster care but it's a state mandate now that each kid have it have their own bed mm -hmm. so grandma needs bunk beds 
right? Or these kids will, will go into foster care. The social worker puts in the need. The need is shared, you know, right here in, um, you know, Kansas City, there are more than 100 churches, right, depending on how much uh, that, are, that are connected by mm -hmm. Care Portal. So depending on the radius mm -hmm. that the social worker enters, maybe 15 or 20 mm -hmm. will receive that need that grandma has. Mm. And then they share it with their congregation and somebody's like, well, I've got some bunk beds. Mm. You know, my kids went to college. I got some bunk beds in the basement or I've got bunk beds in my storage unit or I've got a little bit of extra from the tax refund. And they, seven out of 10 times, they say yes, somebody says yes, and the process reverses and the church delivers the bunk beds to grandma. Well, from the state's perspective, they just got off budget resources to help them solve their child welfare crisis and keep kids out of foster care, mm -hmm. right? From the church's perspective, they just got a vetted real time local need to help them love their neighbor, mm -hmm. delivered in a non-threatening way mm -hmm. to their phone or to their email um, in, in a community of, of Christian churches for collaboration. So these states are, are actually becoming anchor investors in Care Portal, and we're able to show them at times a four to six X ROI because you know, I'll just give an example. We're very grateful for the state of Kansas as one of one of our success stories. Mm -hmm. Last year, they invested two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, which helps us spread and support Care Portal across the state over thirty counties. Two hundred and fifty churches in the state of Kansas met Grandma's need last year to the tune of one point four million dollars mm. of goods and services. Wow! Right, so Kansas gets a seven X, mm. and they're not the only state. There are now more than half a dozen states that are seeing this as a good investment. But it's not. It, but e, but but then there's also what? It's not just the seven X though, because you're you're also talking about resources that may, may kids may not now go into foster so the potential of the number the dollars that that 7x saved is be yeah, challenging to calculate right? very but conservative yeah we try, we're, we're try, absolutely we're trying to be conserv very conservative and i'll tell you the other thing that it doesn't calculate yeah. is a lot of times grandma just doesn't need bunk beds right mm -hmm. bunk beds don't really solve the whole Right. the whole issue, right? But mm -hmm. it's a great place to start and we'll never apologize for helping get a need met. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times a relationship forms and those kids go to VBS or somebody pays for their summer camp or gets them a bicycle. I mean, I can tell stories about relationships that have started and all of those relationships are outside the care portal system. Mm -hmm. So there are ripples mm -hmm. um, that are going on that are uh, beyond our ability to, to calculate them, but we, we celebrate them. Yeah, yeah. Wow, ah, it's just fascinating. Well, it's you know with all the all the resources, so so you're now you're paying programmers to develop your. Uh... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no, they're not. If, if there are any programmers listening to this, yeah. you know, uh, give I, us a call. I we should have been one of those. Oh, I tell you, <laughs> it is the truth. They're in demand. Oh gosh. But they but they they've got skills and yeah. and, and uh, we're grateful for them. It's so interesting. But yeah, we are so, we're, we are a nonprofit that has developers that are writing code on you know on on the bottom floor and on the top floor graphic designers that are designing T-shirts and hoodies and all kinds of mm -hmm. things for for businesses around town through GoX and um, yeah, we just we celebrate all of it we mm -hmm. we feel like those those these tools can can make an impact right yeah, yeah. well that's fascinating what. Like, what are some of the, because you've been in a lot of leadership environments, um, both profit and nonprofit. Um, like, if you if you had to distill two or three key leadership lessons that that you you feel like have like really shaped you as a person, and things that you would want to pass on to other leaders, what would what would a couple of your big ones be yeah well i i, I want to talk a little bit about um about the leaders that i get to serve underneath um you know m i'm going to talk about mike and beth and joe a little bit because i'm so grateful for them one thing about mike that is 
uh, very unique, I think, as a leader, is he really cares about what we're doing, but also gives us the space to do it. You know, and, and that's very rare. Most of the time, if you have if you work for someone they truly care, they're gonna micromanage you a little bit, right? Or if you're working for someone that gives you all the space in the world, it's because they don't really care. Um, but he deeply cares and he gives us the the ability to live out our best uh, at Go Project. With Beth, I, you know, I'd say Beth is better than Mike in, in almost every way, right? And we love Beth. She's, she, is, she is grace uh, personified. She has an amazing story. But the thing that people don't really know about Beth is that at her, at her core is excellence. And I really do think that, that leaders um, set, the, set the bar. You know, an organization cannot uh, grow past the ceiling that the leader sets for it. And with, with Beth, people will see her and they'll, they'll think grace. And I see her and I think excellence. Mm -hmm. they, what they didn't know before they walked into, into her home for this very gracious event is that she's been working her butt off mm -hmm. all day to make them feel special. And what they don't know is that when they leave, whenever they leave, however late they wanna stay, she'll be there with them and then she'll do the dishes, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and she, so, so uh, I, I'm, I think leaders have to lead by example. I think they have to be committed to excellence. Mm -hmm. And what I'll say to, to jo about Joe Knittig is he's, he's fearless. Mm. You know, he, um, he, whenever something hits around the world, I mean, it mm -hmm. can be an, it can be an earthquake. It can, mm -hmm. it can, could, you know, it can be just a, a, you know, really difficult conversation. I mean, there are, he is, uh, he is unafraid and, um, and, and I know I know he trusts in the Lord, but he also has some natural leadership giftings, right? That mm -hmm. he's, he just grew up, you know, uh, as as kind of kind of uh, as a fighter, right? And and so those 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 are three things I love talking about leadership. But you know, um, this this commitment to excellence of leading by example, leading from the front, you know, um, being bold, and 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 then also you know building this team and then letting them live out their gifts, right? I think those are just three things that I'm so grateful for almost every day, you know, mm -hmm. at the Global Orphan Project. It's just, it's made it a joy and a privilege to serve there for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So um, let's, let's let people know how they can connect with Global Orphan Project, how, how you know, how can they Somebody's listening to this. You're going, oh, man. That's fascinating. How how do people get connected? How would what are, what are ways yeah. that people can can respond if they're sure. interested in this? Well, I think we're on most of the social media channels, you know. But if if you're really drawn to um, Care Portal, I would just go to CarePortal.org. You know, C A R E P O R T A L dot O R G. There's a there's a various ways to plug in and if someone's kind of more drawn to um, the business side you know that's goxapparel.com you know if you're going to buy a t-shirt or, or a logoed um, corporate apparel we'd just love the opportunity to earn your business and if somebody has a, a heart for the international goproject.org and, and and i'm not sure when this is going to run so but if it runs before august 20th yeah, it will. Okay. Yeah. We have our big event at the Kauffman Center. It stands for Build, Invest, and Grow. It's one of the great traditions where we just celebrate um, really God's heart for his kids. And we come together about 800 people in a, in a beautiful setting because we feel like that God is... God's work is worthy to celebrate in, in the best and beautiful uh, of, uh, you know, of times and places. Um, so... You could get tickets at that at goproject.org. Mm -hmm. It's a certified date night, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for the guys that are looking for something fun and creative to maybe to take their dates to. Um, I, I would just tell people that we don't believe that these children that have been cut out by the brokenness in our world, we don't believe that they're charity cases. 
we actually believe that they're they're anointed mm. right that investing in the lives of of children is a place to find joy mm -hmm. and a place to find purpose we we don't think that god um is trying to figure out what he's going to do with these kids right we actually think he's sending them into the lives of people who need a bigger view of family mm. and who are looking for joy and looking for for purpose so you know i would just say this is so much bigger than than go project we would love to do life with you but <clears throat> if people aren't interested in the nonprofit thing i would say find a kid on your street or find a kid in your in your family your neighborhood there's so many kids that need someone just to believe in them mm -hmm. and just come alongside you know invest in the life of a kid yeah. if this if this resonates that's probably the best advice i can give yeah i think you know knowing several of the people you've talked about um i think one of the things i've noticed is that there, there's not a person around Mike that's working with Mike that doesn't have that, that, that true passion for kids and to, uh, and to do this kind of work, you know? So I, that's been crystal clear, you know, it's always been front and center, you know, we're, we're here to work with kids. And I think, um, the, the other thing that I, that I love is just, you keep doing practical, ways that people can connect and uh you know all around it you know have you are you familiar with this aces uh this it's a you know you have several of these uh ways to interview kids and they, they figure out how their x number of traumas in their life mm. and can, it's, yes it's one yeah of, yeah no I, I i've heard about that yeah, yes yeah it's one of the ways that you can kind of almost predict kids futures based on how many traumatic events are in their life. And so ACEs is one of the, the tests that uh, people work around at risk kids. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just, there's, there's this really powerful thought that child welfare is kind of ground zero for a lot of societal ills, right? If you look at people that are in the penal system, if you look at the homelessness, if you look at sex trafficking, if you, it, um, foster care mm -hmm. has a direct pipeline to all of those things right and and so uh, in investing in a child right yeah. helps not just that child right then but to yeah. your point it, it helps society down right. down just be better in the long term yeah and I, I think that there's a lot of the research shows that uh, sometimes all a kid needs is one champion mm -hmm. you know like it you don't need sometimes you don't need 10 that's right like if if there's one kid i mean one one adult that champions a kid even an at-risk kid it can it can literally be the thing that that takes them out of the most negative consequences of their of their, of their environment basically. yeah i you know? think we can all name if i ask you like fred tell mm -hmm. me one person that encouraged you as a kid mm -hmm. I bet you could. I bet you could give me a couple I have, names. I have more than one. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But but yeah. but you remember their individual names you bet. is the point. You bet. Yeah. Well, thanks for being with us, Trace, on Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for your heart for children, not only in in international countries, but also right here in Kansas City. Yeah. Thank and, you, Fred. Uh, yeah. I appreciate your heart your work and I, I i love global orphan project so i hope hope everybody that's listening uh if you're not familiar with global orphan project i want to encourage you to go check out their websites and uh this care portal thing is is truly exciting um it's 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 exciting to think about the care that that can deliver to at-risk kids uh and, and working through the local church and working through so many not only government agency but other nonprofit agencies as well yeah so yeah we're better it's, together it's amazing yeah great partnerships going on there we're grateful for your partnership thank you well thanks for being here and thanks everybody for tuning in to spirituality adventures and we'll see you next time this concludes today's episode thanks for tuning in and listening remember if you're watching on youtube subscribe to my youtube channel 
Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.